Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 145, Dan Kaufman and the Kaufman Buck, part one. The strategy, Pope and Young's number two buck, 37 points and 287 5 eighths net inches. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Morris' Sporting Goods and the Eurohanger. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Are you ready to take your deer hunt to the next level? Then tune in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is Doug Castrava from the Horny Buck Seed Company, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey, this is Charles Byron, deer hunting from California all the way to Iowa. You're about to listen to another amazing episode of my favorite deer hunting podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and I'm joined with my good buddy Dusty Phillips over here in Ohio. And I gotta tell you, we are both, both extremely pleased that you're joining us right here, right now, pressing the play button on your iPhone or Android or whatever it is you're listening. Maybe you're on a computer. We can't say thank you enough. And hopefully, you're gonna learn something today, and you're gonna hear a great story, I guarantee it. What's happening, Dusty? Oh, just uh, another beautiful day and a great podcast to come, Jay. I, I look forward to uh, speaking with our guest. And, you know, as always, thanks to all the listeners that uh, download and, and tune in with us every week. You know, we, we do it for you guys. And, uh, you know, we love all of our, our people that follow us and, and hang out with us and comment and share on, on Facebook. And, man, just uh, it's it's one of the things where who would ever thought that uh, we would be recording a show that... Uh, you know, that people can learn things from and and enjoy and and share with their friends and and hang out with their buddies and and play our podcast, Jay. And it's much appreciated that you guys do that. Uh, We we can't thank you enough. So, you know, keep those reviews coming in. Keep subscribing on iTunes. If you're an iPhone user, leave us a a five-star review if you love this show. And, And right there on your iPhone, it's all right there for you. The guest this week shot one of the most amazing bucks that the world has ever seen. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? No doubt about it. If you hold these antlers in your hand, and we have, they are massive. And there is antler everywhere. I mean, all kinds of directions. It's crazy. I believe, currently, it is the number two Pope and Young buck in the entire world. Yeah, crazy, right? Uh, you know, real fortunate to be able to have a set of antlers of that caliber in our hands, Jay. Yes, there was a lot of anticipation as to what, what it would score. Um, and we wanted to interview this person for a while. Uh, we had to wait a little bit until some of the, the, the magazines picked up the story and, and printed it, but we were clear. And we're talking, of course, none other than Dan Kaufman in the Kaufman buck. Holy moly, what a buck, Jay. What a buck. Great story. It's, it's a long interview, so we're breaking it up into two s- segments. Part one this week, which we go over all of Dan's strategies and techniques and the, the, the lead up to the actual hunt. Part two is actually the entire hunt, which lasts the, the, the normal duration that we would normally see in the show. We've broken it up into two one-hour shows approximately. Here's Jay Scott with the Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. Filling in for Jim Keller this week for the Big Buck Registry, this is Jay Scott with the Deer News. Our first story, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service distributes $1.1 billion to state wildlife agencies. Under the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937 and under the Dingle-Johnson Act of 1950, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service collects excise tax dollars on the hunting, boating, and fishing industries. 
The Pittman-Robertson Act derives its dollars from taxes on firearms, bows, and ammunition, whereas the Dingle-Johnson Act derives its dollars from taxes on sport fishing tackle, some boat engines, and small engine fuel, of which these costs are handed down to the end user. In turn, those excise taxes are given to the Secretary of the Interior to be distributed to state wildlife agencies through a complicated formula based off the size of the state, size of the body of water, and the number of licensed hunters and fishermen. On March 6, 2016, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service distributed $1.1 billion to state agencies. The funding was announced by Bob Curry, Deputy Assistant Director of the Services Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration, the program which administers the funds. To date, the program has distributed more than $18 billion for state conservation and recreation projects. Our next story was first reported by the AFP. Stone Age humans brought deer to Scotland by sea. In a Red Deer study reported by David Stan of Cardiff University, it is suggested that humans may have been managing deer herds dating back 5,500 years ago. Based on DNA analysis, studies show that the deer on Scotland's northernmost islands were unlikely to have come from seemingly obvious places like mainland Scotland, Ireland, and Norway. According to the study, it appears that the deer were likely captured and transported over long distances and that the Neolithic humans had stronger relationships with wild game than first thought. Transportation of large domestic game was normal, but transportation of wild game was thought to be non-existent. Scientists have concluded that all animals, including deer, must have been introduced from seafaring people. The islands were covered by ice during the last ice age and have been separated from the mainland, too far a distance for a deer to swim. It was believed that the deer must have been brought from nearby mainland Scotland, boat hopping from island to island, but DNA analysis of deer bones of that time frame found that the deer DNA on the mainland did not match the deer from Britain, Ireland, Western Europe, or Scandinavia. The hunt for the ancestor of the Scottish deer is still underway. Our next story was first reported by GoHunt.com. 230-inch mule deer poached in Wyoming. A 230-inch non-typical mule deer buck was shot by Nate Strong of Wyoming, was on display at the Hunt Expo in Salt Lake earlier this year. Shortly thereafter, a possible poaching investigation was launched after an anonymous person reported that a well-known deer was killed illegally after the season had ended. A group of locals last saw the buck on November 7, 2015, a month after the mule deer season closed. The investigation revealed that Strong had tagged a large typical mule deer in September 2015 using his resident license. It also showed that Strong had drawn a 2015 HA-138 Type 3 deer license, which was good for a whitetail buck only. Just a few days after the hunt expo ended, authorities obtained a search warrant to seize the mount in Strong's home. That same day, Strong admitted that he had killed the non-typical buck and placed his white-tailed deer license on the mule deer. Strong claimed that the buck was a white-tailed mule deer hybrid. A forensics laboratory team concluded later in March that the deer had only mule deer DNA and that it was in fact a mule deer and not a white-tailed mule deer hybrid. Strong then admitted that he shot the buck illegally. Strong is currently facing misdemeanor charges, but hunters are also calling for a violation of the Lacey Act, claiming that by taking the buck to Utah to get mounted, he would have a better chance of getting it mounted without questioning. Our final story comes out of Alabama. Alabama's gun season may be expanded to February 10th statewide. In a move that is sure to make Alabama deer hunters happy, the Alabama Conservation Advisory Board made numerous recommended changes to the hunting and fishing regulations during the meeting on March 26th. The recommendation is to run the deer season continuously from November 19, 2016 to February 10, 2017 statewide with no closed season. There would also be an archery season from October 15th to October 25th. The expanded deer season is contingent upon a proposed mandatory game check harvest reporting system making it through the legislative review process. That concludes this week's edition of the Deer News. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please send an email to jim at bigbuckregistry.com. Filling in for Jim Keller, this is Jay Scott with the Deer News. Thank you, Jay Scott, for filling in this week for Jim Keller with the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Dan Kaufman. It's been nonstop. I hate to complain. I'm not complaining by no means, but it's been busy. Two, I bet. Two-year-old, a four-month-old, uh, I ride the busiest medic in, well, one of the busiest medics in the city of Columbus. And then on top of that, this whole deal and trying to deal with sponsors and everything else. So, busy. 
Yeah, that'll keep you busy. And he shot a pretty nice buck, too. Not bad. Not bad. It's all right. He's off my fingers. I take care of him. You have to, get, you have to shoot the big one next year. Bad genes. <laughs> You're the genetics. All right. I got to find a can of dip here. I'm not going to make it without it. Hey, you want one? Okay, yeah. Oh, I Dusty's going to get a dip, Dan. Thanks uh, for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. Hey, it's no problem. I told you guys I would. I, I, um, you know, it's, it's. I'm sorry it took so long. It's just been, it's been crazy, and that's, that's why I told you and Dusty. I'm like, keep in touch with me. <laughs> don't I tell people all the time? I'm like, don't feel like you're bothering me. Keep in touch because it, it's. I mean, like I said, I'm not complaining by no means, but it's sometimes hard for me to remember <laughs> what. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, you got you got people tr- pulling on you from. 20 different directions you're not going to remember plus you have your regular job and you have kids and you know that's that's a, a full job in itself so and that whole the whole north american whitetail story that i had 90 hours in that i mean in that story it's really? it actually a lot i had 13 pages this is what what i had on it so 90 and, hours reduces to 13 pages when it's all said and done yep i had 13 pages and then they cut it down to what five they, I mean, they, there's a lot of it that's not in there, like just detailed information, right. of certain tactics I used, and and me and Gordon talked. We're gonna we're gonna do some other stuff talking about some of the tactics and yep. and other things that kind of went with the whole story. Well, that's cool, and that's the kind of stuff I'd like to open up about. Get some of that other stuff that didn't make it to the print. Yeah, no, no problem at all. I'm like I said, I'm full go now. And Dan, where are you from? I live in just outside of Junction City, Ohio. I'm originally from Louisiana, Marrero, Louisiana, where I was born. Oh, no kidding. I didn't live there long. We moved up to Ohio and grew up in the, uh, uh, just south of Columbus, about 35, 40 minutes south of Columbus in that kind of whole region, southeast. So Very nice. Yeah, wh- How old were you when you moved? Ah, oh, goodness, four. I mean, I don't remember it. So how'd you get into deer? Or let's, let's back up a little bit even from when you moved. So you're four years old. You show up in, in Ohio. Mm-hmm. What what are your recollections uh, and when you were four years old? Uh, none. No, got nothing. <laughs> Anything when I was none. four. Right. Um, at some point, my father, sometime around probably four or five years old, six maybe, my mother met my um, the man I call my father, um, mm-hmm. Don Groves. He's uh, he's the one who got me into hunting. He uh, heck, I remember. I can't imagine. It. I was but five or six, and I actually do remember sitting on his lap. And um, shooting a muzzleloader at a buck at about five years old. We missed it. <laughs> we couldn't find oh, it. Wow. Uh, it was raining. It was the last day. Of, I think it was either the last, you know, there was only two days of muzzleloading season back then. Um, probably the last day of muzzleloading season. And uh, that's probably the first thing I remember. As a matter of fact, actually, I take that back. When I was younger than that, um, the way my dad actually got me started hunting was he allowed me to carry around a BB gun and he wouldn't even let me load it. Um, you know, and it was just his way of, you know, I had to prove to him that I wasn't going to aim it in the wrong direction or, sure. or anything yeah. like that. And once I proved that to him, I was allowed to put BBs in it. And I vaguely remember there was a time where, uh, I aimed it at his knee or something. Well, BBs came out and <laughs> it was a <laughs> training. Whoops. <laughs> Eventually, uh, heck, I think I killed my first squirrel at about goodness, uh, six five six years old with it i remember as a single shot 16 gauge uh winchester red letter it was uh kicked the heck out of my shoulder i remember that well that one stuck huh that's the one you remember oh yeah that and the old double barrel pull bow trigger tricks and everything yeah, yeah. our uncles and cousins and everybody played on us the ones that kick like mules always tend to kind of stick around for a while in your brain yeah i usually kill on both ends too yeah. So what do you do now for a living? Is uh, I mean, You're not a professional hunter. You just happen to shoot a really big deer. Uh, what do you do full-time usually? Absolutely. Um, I am a Columbus fireman. I'm a paramedic and a firefighter for the city of Columbus. Oh, wow. I work at uh, Station 1, Medic 1, Engine 1. Um, we're not really uh, got a lot of medics around right now, so I spend most of my time on the medic, a little bit on the engine. Probably one of the busiest uh, medics in the city for sure. Oh, beautiful. Well, thanks for doing that. It's an important job and, you know, it's saving lives. Is- yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it does. But, it, you know, it's, it's, you won't meet too many firemen that don't love their job. It's, it's an enjoyable yeah. job. It's a fun job. You know, especially us up at Columbus, we're, we're well taken care of. I mean, it's a good place to work and we, uh, we definitely, we enjoy it. That's for sure. It's interesting you say that because, 
of the, all the people we've interviewed, I would say the most common answer for profession outside of just you know loving deer hunting, but their profession is typically firefighter. You got to keep in mind, when I go to the fire department, I, I work on a medic for 24 hours. I'll take 18 to 20 runs in that 24 hours. So the good chance is I didn't sleep. So, you know, when deer season comes along and I work and I have two days off, don't get me wrong, in order for me to stay up and hunt and feed and trail camera and do all the things I do, there's a lot of times I'm I'm pushing through. I mean, I, you know, when we work 24 hours, in reality, that next day off, we should probably be sleeping. Right, right, right. <laughs> So, um, you know, but when we have opportunity to get, you know, vacation occasionally and then we're allowed to do what's called a trade. We can trade with other guys, say that, you know, I work a ton in the summer. I worked 650 hours of overtime last year. As soon as bow season went, came in, I quit working. Um, and we're allowed to also trade. So I'll work for somebody in the summer on a different shift than me and yeah. then they'll pay me back during hunt season. So I, I work a ton through the summer just working trades for people and then come bow season, come deer season, you know, September, um, you know, they'll be working for me and I'll have some more time off. Got it. So you, you plan ahead. You're anticipating this time that's coming down and you're going to get on it and you're going to make sure that you have plenty of deer hunting time when the oh, fall rolls around. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I've already have vacation revolves around pretty much September 1st all the way through um, the end of the year. Gotcha. I mean, it's, you know, I always try to get off that first week of bow season and about the last three weeks of bow season because that's the only times in Ohio that I am guaranteed that I can, well, I shouldn't say nothing's guaranteed, but I got a pretty good opportunity to put put a pattern on something. Gotcha. All right. Well, how old were you when you, or would you say you were when there was a, a, a fortified necessity to go hunting in your life oh wow um i don't know or at um, least it feels like it and i mean more not not that you need it to live necessarily but it's something like it's 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 deep in your ingrained in your soul and you've got to do it well i can tell you this my <laughs> ex-wife ran into my taxidermist about six <laughs> she she her words to him were you were probably one of the biggest problems of our marriage. <laughs> and he said, well, if it makes you feel any better, your ex-husband was one of my best customers. <laughs> I, I've always, I guess, you know, it, really the last few years is when I've really stepped it up a lot. Um, I've always, I, I can, can't remember the last time that, you know, there, I remember there being a time when I only hunted from, you know, I, I, September, you know, the bow season would come in. I'd start feeding maybe a week ahead of time and, you know, start trail camera and hunt, you know. But right. that was, if I had to guess, in my, uh, you know, 21, 22. And then sometime around, you know, mid-20s, I started feeding more often. Um, you know, I'd feed a couple months ahead. And it wasn't till the last three or four years that I really started wanting to lease a lot of land, focus on my whole, my whole herd feeding them, you know, 365 days a year, men are on 365 days a year because, you know, I come to realize that if you can keep your herd healthy 365 days a year, if you can keep them, you know, 100% healthy, when they start growing them new horns, they can put 100% of their energy into growth instead of having to put it to recover their body from winter. And when I realized that, it was, that's when I, I can honestly say is I started hammering feed year round and mineral and, and really paying attention. Mm. I would say sometime around 27, 28 years old is when I really started, excuse me, started putting, um, you know, more time in it. But I mean, I killed my first, uh, it was a button buck, eight years old with a bow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from there on, it was, I'll be honest with you, I grew up in a family that hunted. I, I couldn't imagine that there was one year that I didn't hunt ever. So, so you're surrounded by it. It was, no, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've got, probably 15 cousins, uncles, and, you know, any, even aunts that, that we all hunt. And everybody's, my whole family, um, it, that's all they do is hunt. <laughs> gotcha. All right. So you, it's it's a family tradition, and it's something that you adopted. And, I mean, you, you love it, right? I mean, it's 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 not something you do because you're trying to make somebody feel good. You're doing it for yourself. You're It's something that, that makes you feel good. Absolutely. I, I tell you what, the one thing I love about hunting more than anything is, you know, it's the one thing that, you know, we have left that, you know, 
the more you put in, the more you get out. It's one of those things that I feel that, you know, you can take one guy and he can hunt, you know, a couple of days a year and, and not worry about horns, not worry about anything else, but just go out, sit in a stand, enjoy himself. And, you know, he puts, he could put the least amount of time as possible and he's still going to have a blast and he's still going to have fun because he enjoys it. But then you take the guy who hunts, you know, he, who's 365 days a year, his mind is on hunting. He sinks all his heart, time, and money into hunting and he's going to, they're, they're both going to enjoy it the same amount. But yet still the guy who puts more time in is more than likely going to, he's going to succeed more versus the guy who puts less time in. So I guess my thing is, is you can put, as much time in it as you want, you're going to get out of it what you put into it, and you're going to enjoy it regardless. And that's one of those things I like about it. You know, anything, you know, any more, you know, surrounding us and all the things going on, you know, it's, it's sometimes it seems like the more you put in, the more you may be giving to somebody else. Are, are you more a bow hunter or a gun hunter at, the, at this phase in your life? Bow hunter. I'll be honest with you. Um, I recently just sold two pistols because I have a two-year-old opening drawers now. And it just scares the heck out of me. And um, I, 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 heck, I think I have a, a duck gun, a turkey gun, and uh, an 1100 that I have because it was it's been a family gun for many, many, many years. And then a 22 that my grandpa gave me before he passed away. That's it. That's all the guns I have. I just I don't for whatever reason I've always been a bow hunter. I love bow hunting. Nice, very nice. So th- th- this deer that you shot. There was a lot of anticipation about what this thing was going to score out at, and were were you thinking that it was it, it was going to take a number one position when it was all said and done? Um, I wouldn't say that. No, uh, you know, a good buddy of mine uh, actually scored that deer out, and I actually still have the paper that shows it off. I think three somewhere between three and five pictures I sent him, and he takes a lot of pride in scoring off pictures, and he's actually really good at it. He scored it within, I think, three-quarters of an inch from what it was. So we knew he was right there at 300 inches. Mm. Obviously, I knew there was an opportunity that he could be number one bow kill, but, you know, I wasn't I wouldn't counting on it just because, you know, I, I think that – you know, every thought that crossed in my, crossed my mind in them two years, there was, a, you know, I, I was scared to even try to think that it would be number one. I was scared to even try to think that I had, a, you know, had a that great of an opportunity to kill him just because, you know, they say don't count your chickens before they had. Right. It's one of those theories, like, I, I truly did not believe I would kill this deer. Um, I had friends that told me, you're you're definitely getting this deer. You're definitely going to kill this deer. And I would look at him and say, what in the world makes you think that? He is the most nocturnal deer I've ever seen in my life. And I, who am I to be the one that gets to kill this thing, you know? And that yeah. was kind of my attitude. And his thing, their thing was, you know, every time that this dis- this deer would disappear for a week or two, Mm-hmm. I would tell them, and they were close friends of mine. I'd say, "Man, I think he's bedded right over there, right over there in that swell, right in the middle of that bean field. I think he's bedded over there." I'd get trail cameras kind of around where I could try to focus on that area, and sure enough, within four or five days, yep, I was right. He was bedded right there, and they just they seemed to think I knew him too well not to kill him. But like I said, in in two hunting seasons, this deer showed up three times in the daylight, and the third time I put an arrow on him. So for me to imagine that I was going to get an opportunity at him was just goodness. It was it was an exciting feeling, but I was a nervous wreck for this whole bow season. I it, you know in previous to it, as soon as I knew what he was, I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> <laughs> How would, what did you do to control yourself? I mean, the, the, you're you, you're faced with a potential record buck year, world record, and you're you've got to go into the field every day knowing that this could happen. And, and we're not talking high fence here; we're talking just fair chase by oh, chance. This is a random chance. There were there were right around three to five other bow hunters that I consider very good avid hunters that knew about this deer and were hunting this deer. And, um, you know, goodness, I, I, I couldn't have, like I said, I couldn't have imagined that I had a, any better chance than anybody else, you know. Um, and that's kind of why I took certain tactics that I took was because in my mind I felt like, well, I have to give this deer something on my property that nobody else is going to give them. And, and 
I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that was, mm. what it was going to take to make him more comfortable on my property. So your friends thought that you were going to be the one because you seem to have a more intimate knowledge of this particular buck. Well, keep in mind the guys that I talk of are, um, you know, basically my neighbor and a, and a lieutenant of mine at work. They, you know, they didn't, obviously, they didn't have you know, they weren't hunting anywhere close to this buck. Anybody else that hunted this buck, I really, to be honest with you, avoided them at all. Costs. All right. Gotcha. I didn't want to have to lie to them or, or not tell them something <laughs> or keep something from them. And I hate to say it, friends or not, I wasn't going to. <laughs> right. Classic, classic hunting situation there where you've, you're, you're on to something and you won't even tell your best friend what's going on. How many times do you think you got to ask a question about this buck that you avoided the question? Oh, mm, yes. that's a good question. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I had a good friend of mine. Um, he actually processes my deer for me. <laughs> he hunts fairly close. And uh, he was asking questions here and there. And, and I kind of sensed that, man, he's he's kind of uh, he's kind of onto this. And we laugh about this now. But uh, so <laughs> he's asking me one morning, oh, are you still after that big buck? And I said, no, I ain't seen him. I'm just a couple of nine pointers, you know, nothing big. Of course, you know, I'm getting pictures of them every other day, every two days, every three days. And I just, I was nervous as heck. And it just so happens my beans started turning yellow. And when my beans started turned yellow, that deer disappeared. And we're what, two, three, we're, we're like getting into bow season. And I'm, I'm just nervous. You know, I, I can't even sleep at night. Stomach's turning. Well, he happens to call me about this time. And just before that, uh, he, the beans on his farm, which weren't within a half a mile to a mile from my farm, were about as green as beans can get. And I'm just sitting there thinking, goodness, I would be scoping that field in the evenings, trying to see where he was. I'd drive down there and see. Couldn't find him, couldn't find him. I just had a hunch that he was on this guy's farm. So this guy, you know, my processor, he calls me and he starts asking questions again. And I said, you're never going to believe this, man. And uh, he said, what? And I said, man, I was talking to a buddy of mine this morning, and he was heading to work. And uh, I said, he said that there was two hillbillies and a Toyota pulled off the side of the tra- road. <laughs> and he, he he's never he'd seen pictures of my deer, didn't know about it. But, you know, he described the buck I've been hunting to a T and said these hillbillies hit it in their Toyota. And I said, yeah, I, I told him, I said, but. I drove down there. I don't see any deer laying there. And, you know, I said, you know, heck, you're a police officer. I said, you'd know if a sheriff had been down there. I said, I'll tell you what, I guarantee you them guys cut that head off that thing and took off. And uh, he's like, you got to be kidding me, you know. And I, <laughs> so <laughs> I, didn't, I never told him any different. <laughs> and that rumor started spreading. It got hit by a car. And I thought, well, maybe that'll ease some, ease some pain off. <laughs> So I had a decent rumor going there, but, you know, I just, <laughs> I had people calling me every day, you know, have you seen that big buck? Have you seen him? And, and I'm just like, goodness, I, I, I don't want to give anybody more no, any more knowledge than I have to. <laughs> right. That's crazy. Wow. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your strategies, Dan. You've, you've definitely, I mean, you had to learn about this massive deer and figure out how to put this whole puzzle together and it doesn't come easily. It's not something that's, there's no book, there's no textbook, there's no diagram to make you do it. you got to figure this out on your own. Well, absolutely. And goodness, if there was, you know, every deer is different. <laughs> and, um, you know, I would say, you know, two years ago when, when I first saw him, I was hunting this farm with another good buddy of mine. And um, he's actually the one who caught trail camera pictures of him first. And when he showed it to me, it was a blurry picture, but you could just tell it was a big buck. And he, um, anyway, so he brings it to me and I said, yeah, that's a monster. I said, but you know, it's getting close to rut. You know, he may be just passing through. We may never see him again. Well, we didn't for like two weeks and then I got a blurry picture of him. And then, you know, shortly after that, we both started getting pictures of him and he was, I would say 190 to 200 inches. So we were very excited, but on the other hand, he wasn't 300 inches, you know? So we, we both haunted him. And, and to be honest with you, he disappeared for a while. And I was after another deer that I called G311. He was 165-inch, 11-point. He had a split G3 on the left side. Another guy ended up actually killing him late November. And um, when he killed him, you know, I decided, well, I'm going to go to the other side of the farm where we'd been seeing this, you know, buck we called, I called Christmas tree. I called him Christmas tree because he had just crap going everywhere. 
real weak on the left side, but I mean, his left uh, shed, I actually have it. It scored 107 inches, but like I said, he was weak on the left side. And I'd say, you know, he might've been right at 200 inches. So I started feeding the heck out of it, mineral on it. You know, um, I've always, you know, for the last several years, I've, I've paid attention to the wind quite a bit, but I've never really paid attention to barometric pressure, the moon phase, anything like that. And, um, so, you know, I, I start hunting this deer. It's late February. I'm hunting over corn. I'm playing the wind. You know, he just, he wasn't coming in that corn pile in the daylight. And actually he didn't ever come into the corn pile in the daylight until when I was at the ATA last year. Um, he did show up and it was, you know, I knew that in order to get him to come in there, it was going to have to be brutal cold and, you know, it, it was going to be over a food source. Hmm. Well, I never really got on him that year. I mean, you know, I couple close occasions, never saw him, had plenty of trail camera pictures, but it was all through the night. And then obviously sometime around January 26th is when I realized, okay, weather's getting warmer. He's not showed up to a corn pile yet in the daylight other than the one time I was gone and it was like negative 10 degrees. So I said, you know, I, I got this four and a half year old deer. He's a hundred and I think right at 140 inches on another farm. He's showing up every single day. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go pursue him. And I went and hunted him a couple of times, got some video footage, um, harvested him. And, and, you know, lo and behold, my, that buck never did show up that year. Hmm. So after that, obviously the big hunt was finding his sheds. Um, eventually I did, I found his sheds. Uh, I think he dropped them on like, I think I want to say February 11th. I picked him up on February 12th and we thought he was injured because he was so weak on the left side, on the right side. But, you know, for him to grow, we think he's seven and a half. And for him to grow 90 inches in that last year, I got to assume that he was not coming back from an injury. And maybe he just broke that right main beam off. But we never did find the right side to his sheds. Um, so then we, we came into, you know, the, the new year and summertime goes by. And this buck, you know, I knew, well, next year he's going to be bigger than he was this year. So this is, you know, this is a big deal for me. So uh, I actually... At that point when season went on, I found his shed. You know, I said, I'm going to step up my game. And I started paying attention to the pictures. You know, I had cameras everywhere. Um, you know, and I would, I, I knew this deer without horns on him that year. I mean, when he, I knew him, I studied him enough to where I knew where he was when he didn't even have horns on him. Um, now, when he started growing, he looked like he had two 20 ounce pop cans coming out of his head. So immediately it was like game on. (laughs) And, um, I mean, I think he may have disappeared, um, may sometime in April, he disappeared for two or three weeks. And when he came back, um, well, let's see, May, June, July, June or July is when I realized that, holy crap, this is not a 200 inch deer. This is not a 220 inch deer. This is not, this is a massive deer. And, um, so I just kept watching him, and then that's when I realized, okay, now I really need to step up my game. Um, you know, I, I have a lieutenant at work, Lieutenant Steve Riley. He, uh, you know, I caught on to him. You know, he talked a lot about he don't like feeding. He does not feed deer. He um, he really studies topography. He pays attention to the moon a lot, um, mm-hmm. and he takes a lot of pride in that. And it's not that he has a problem with feeding or anything like that, but he just takes a lot of pride in – um, doing it that way without the feed. So, you know, the more I got to listening to him and then, you know, my neighbor, um, Sean music, he, he, he's, you know, he hunts traditional, no sights. And, you know, he's, he's been hunting quite a bit longer than me too. And the more I got to thinking about this deer and thinking about these guys that I talked to about deer hunting and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I would be stupid to think that my knowledge base, um, not that it's not enough, but I would be, stupid to think that I, I couldn't get better. And uh, Jeremy Mills, too, you know, the guy that I film with and I'm on a show with, me and him talked a lot about it. And I had a real tight circle that I talked to about it. And um, I basically went to these guys and said, look, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm hunting. How would you approach this? And and we kind of just put all our thoughts together. You know, we would talk about, you know, anywhere from, you know, the, the topography to the moon to, you know, how this deer traveled. And, and you know, at some point I even come to the conclusion i looked at my neighbor and i said you know everything that i've seen from this deer there's no way no chance that i am going to kill him over a corn pile and you know i started talking to um, steve about it too and 
and Jeremy. And, and I, I tell you, I started listening, uh, watching and reading a lot of Adam Hayes stuff. Okay. Um, it, it really kind of interested me. And, and, you know, he talks about making, you have to give that, that mature buck the wind and, and, you know, not hunting over corn piles, stuff like that. So th- there, there wasn't one thing that crossed my Facebook page that I wasn't intrigued with that had to do with hunting. In my mind, I was going to take every last bit of knowledge that I possibly could. And there was some stuff that I didn't use, and there was stuff that, I, my, good, my goodness, it helped me dramatically. So with all that being said, yeah, I mean, I, I pulled knowledge from anywhere possible. I mean, in my mind, this was, this was it for me. This was my chance to, to do something that would really put a mark in my world. And um, so, you know, I started getting more interested in the moon and studying the moon. Um, one of the things that was really cool that I kind of caught on to with my, just a stupid mi- a mistake, um, I was feeding and checking trail cameras. And I dumped, you know, this is a big wide open farm with just spots of trees. I mean, it's probably four or 500 acres and it's just kind of spotty. And um, you can drive your truck around the whole farm. And I accidentally dumped a pile of mineral on the ground just out in the middle of this field where a trail camera was on a like a corner, almost type of a pinch point. Um, And that deer started showing up every single night on that mineral lick. Now, as far as a corn pile goes... Late winter, when it was cold and there was no food on the ground, he'd show up to it. As soon as his horns hardened up, he was done with the corn pile. Now, really interesting. Yeah, he did. He didn't come close to it unless it was midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Especially the second year, you know. Obviously, the first year, I didn't really get to see him too much in the summer or at all. He didn't show up till um, November the first year. So I hunted him that season. And then obviously late winter, like I said, February, when it was two degrees outside, he'd be at the corn pile occasionally in the day, you know, close to dark, close to daylight. But for the most part, it was midnight, one o'clock, all summer long, midnight, one o'clock. But he'd show up in the daylight, you know, occasionally. And as soon as his horn started hardening, it was like he just had no interest in the corn pile. And uh, you, you didn't see him again on it. But like I said, he kept showing up on that mineral pile. And the only thing I can think of is... I feel that after seven years, a deer like that has been educated, especially in that area. With as many people that hunt over corn piles, he, he's been educated, and he knows that, you know, that corn pile is not a safe bet. But I almost feel like he doesn't, like that buck did not register a mineral pile the same as a corn pile, and I learned that from that. So then when I realized that, one of the things I did was I separated all my corn and mineral. So I started really thinking hard about it, and I'd sit down and look at the topography maps, and I'd, you know, pay attention to where my corn was. I'd go 80 yards, 80 to 100 yards downwind of my corn pile and try to put my mineral piles, like, in pinch points or on corners or, you know, some type of staging area. And what I found is a lot of these mature bucks, we they would go to that mineral in the daylight, but, you know, they would be downwind of that corn pile stage until dark. So I learned a lot from just that little mistake of dumping a five-gallon bucket of mineral on the ground on an open field. Um, so that's one of the things I did. Um, another thing this buck I noticed about him is I would catch him on trail camera once or twice, and then he would vanish from that trail camera again. And like I said, I had somewhere between 15, you know, about probably 15 cameras running at most times. Gotcha. And in two weeks, I might have caught him on one or two cameras. And, you know, Josh, the guy I hunted with, same thing. And I noticed that if a camera sat there too long, he would never show up on it again. And in my mind, I got to thinking, I wonder if me going there so many times or, you know, every two weeks after I've been there three or four times, this deer just starts skirting around it because he smelled me there two or three times. So I started adjusting my cameras and I would just, I'm talking adjust them 30 yards, but be facing somewhat in the same position or maybe, you know, to the right a little bit more. I'd start catching them more often and I'd start catching glimpses of them. And that's how, you know, I really put, I never put a pattern on them, but I, I felt like I knew all his travel corridors of that farm. Gotcha. So you, you ended up backing off a little bit your camera's distances just to perhaps, who knows what they think, who knows what they can smell exactly, but you, you had a hunch and that, that led you to backing it up a little bit and then you started getting more pictures. That's very interesting. Yes, I started getting more pictures, um, and, you know, 
I, I also noticed I started getting pictures of other bucks on the farm more too. Hmm. So, I mean, it, it definitely, you know, the other, one of the other things I did was I started doing everything right off my UTV if I could. You know, there's certain spots that I fed that I just couldn't, but, you know, I, I tried to feed everything and check trail cameras, pull cars. I tried to do everything off my UTV to where there was cameras where I'd just pull right up to yank the card out of it and put a new card in it and move on. And I always left it running the whole time when I was feeding just because, you know, how many times have you, you, you've seen a deer out in the field and you're in a truck or a UTV or something, and it, it, don't, it don't even act like it cares until you shut that UTV off or car off or until you step out of it. So, yeah, I would I left it running, and, and I did everything quickly. I always was very careful with uh, scent control, rubber boots. My house, actually, um, I'm a single guy, so I can do this, but uh, I do not have normal detergent in my house. <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk about your detergent a little bit here, Dan. <laughs> it's uh, basically everything I wash my clothes with is, is scent-free detergent. It's, it's everything. everything I wash my clothes. I eat my street clothes, you name it, everything. Yeah. A smelly detergent does not go through my washer and dry or nothing. Um, you know, my my the, what I wash in daily, you know, is is um, all scent free detergent. That's what I bathe in. That's what, just you don't have a, a scent particle that enters your house. Period. Do you, do you think it's interesting that the, that that buck started appearing more when you backed off the cameras? Was that like a learning experience for you? Oh, absolutely. You know, like I was saying earlier, I think every buck's different. And I think, in my personal opinion, you got to treat them different. And I almost wonder if, you know, if his twin brother came in there, if he would act completely different. For whatever reason, that buck just seemed to be good at avoiding the camera. I mean, you think about it. I, I got to assume the average hunter runs three to four cameras, you know, not 15 or 20. And if I was running three to four cameras on that farm, I can't imagine that I would have gotten more than a picture a month off that deer and just by having all them cameras out there and and moving them and and adjusting them you know i'd I'd make lists i have a list of every single pinch point funnel bend corner um you know public scrape you know um anything that that is a a pathway for a deer or a travel corridor for a deer and i would just i have that list and and accordingly to the what the normal winds were for that week or that time of year or whatever i would just start moving cameras and and i was trying to get a pattern on them like i said he never did put a pattern but i was trying there was 150 155 inch deer on that farm um the whole season that wow i could have i felt like if if i would have just pursued them you know i i would have definitely put them down but obviously i wasn't going to Mm. um but yeah, as far as the cameras, I did think it was that was pretty crazy that he could figure out how to avoid them like he did. How how many years total were you hunting this buck? Just two, uh, and Just really two. Not two years. Um, you understand? I didn't start hunting that farm until I think we got that farm in probably uh, August, August of um, uh, of you know lat- two years ago. Okay. And, um, we started trail camera and feeding. And actually what happened was a, a good buddy of mine came to me and he's avid goose and duck hunter. And, you know, he deer hunted before too, bow hunted. And, and he came to me and asked me, he said, Hey, if, uh, he said, I know you're, you're really big into hunting mature deer. He's like, I want to be, he's like, you know, I've got a lot of pictures of them, but you know, I just, if I got us a farm, would you be willing to show me the ropes? And I said, Oh, absolutely. Heck yeah. So, um, you know, we started, he started looking for a farm. I started looking for a farm and Eventually, uh, he's the one who found this farm. They're friends of his, and um, we took on the farm together. We started putting trail cameras up and just started picking deer, and, and this deer didn't show up till, like I said, probably mid-November is uh, when it came in, and um, the first year, and then, you know, we hunted them all that season, and then, you, you know, Josh, you know, he kind of, um, you know, he's not much, he, he's not, he definitely put some time in, but in the summertime, he kind of backs off. He works a different type of job. You know, he works a lot of hours in the summertime and wasn't able to put the same amount of time in in the summertime to kind of keep up with it. Yeah. So I kept mineral on the farm, feeding the farm and really hammering it. And, um, and then we hunted them the second season. So I guess to say two years, yeah, two seasons is more like it. Okay. Did you hunt them at all the first year? Yes. Okay. Uh, the first year in the beginning, obviously, I didn't know he was there. After November, when he showed up, like I said, I assumed he was a rut buck and he wasn't coming back, which in reality, it was probably the case. I don't feel that that farm was his home, 
I feel that um, he lived on another farm, and I feel that he came through there because it was the rut. Because it wasn't until mid to late December when he came back. And, you know, obviously when we knew that deer was in the area, in my mind I thought, you know, and I was already feeding 365 days a year anyways, but I thought I need to go to roasted soybeans, corn. I was keeping my protein up to 18%, um, feeding mineral, you know, and I wanted to have a desirable farm. So if that, when everybody else in the area quit feeding and that deer came back looking for food, he would have it and unstoppable. He'd have as much as he wanted. And I truly do believe that's, that's what made him have the desire to come back to that farm and, and, and he stuck around and pretty much was, I would go to say he was there 75% of the time. It seemed like. Gotcha. All right. So you, you, you kind of had this hunch and you, you made it a special place for him when it was all said and done, when everybody else gave up, you were still going to be giving a, a deer exactly what a big deer would want. I was feeding probably 2000 pounds of corn and roasted soybeans, uh, every two weeks, um, even after deer season went out all the way until, oh goodness, thank God that, you know, um, April, May came around and things started growing. They quit eating as much because they were, they were breaking my bank. <laughs> that brings up a good point. How, how much did it cost to feed like that per month? Can you oh, break that down for goodness. us? Yeah, I could. Um, you know, I rem- the, the last number that me and Jeremy talked that we spread out all over a farm, at, at one point we fed well over 50,000 pounds of corn. Um, wow. That was two years ago. Now, we went to gravity feeders um, for that reason because we got tired of feeding the groundhogs, coons, and everything else. And um, I would go to say, you know, a 50-pound bag of roasted soybeans is about 16 bucks. Um, and then we, we are fortunate to where we do um, buy our corn at a good rate. Cause we buy it off the farmer. So we pay about roughly 350 to 375 a bushel for corn. Um so, you know, you think, I'd say, I, you know, if I was feeding a thousand pounds of feed and, jam, it, it, you know, November is when I would really start hitting the soybeans. And I would start out at 12 percent, 8 to 12 percent um, protein because corn has naturally, what, 7 percent. And then I would get enough soybeans in there in my mix to get it up to around 12 percent. And then late November, I try to be up around 14 to 16 percent and then buy you know, by the time December hits and the months start getting cold and there ain't much food on the ground, I try to be at 18% um, feed, which is roughly equivalent to, you know, 700 pounds of corn to 300 pounds of roasted soybeans, 350 to 650 to be exact, I think. You're looking at 32, 64, 100 and 120 something pound, dollars for roasted soybeans. And then on top of that, you know, seven, eight, seven hundred pounds, six hundred fifty, seven hundred pounds of corn at three fifty a bushel, so three fifty per fifty six. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say it wasn't nothing to be to say I was feeding two hundred dollars a month. Yeah, it at least. I mean, that's not even including mineral at a dollar a pound. So I'd say I was spending on that farm. I'd say I was spending three hundred to three hundred fifty bucks a month, probably. No kidding. So so my feeding regimen pretty much is mineral is year round. Absolutely. I pound the mineral to them year round as much as they will take. Um, as far as corn and roasted soybeans, um, I would say that, you know, that time right around July, August, August time is when I just start feeding corn and, and the deer don't seem to really kick in until mid September. They start hitting the corn hard. Well, at that point, you know, they're hitting the mineral. I figure the corn is, it's just there to maybe get a couple of good pictures and see what, what we've got in there. And then, you know, but they got plenty to eat at that time. And then when the crops start coming off, they still have plenty to eat on the ground. But then when that November time hits, there's, it's not as easy for them to get the protein. So that's why I start feeding the roasted soybeans. So then, you know, I work my way up. So I feed the corn and then all the way through right about now, um, in the next two to three weeks, is when, you know, I'm still feeding roughly 18% feed. Now, they've slowed down a lot because there's not snow on the ground. It's warmer. You know, I don't think they have to eat as much to stay warm like they do, you know. And so they've slowed down on it. And I would say right before turkey season starts, about about two, three weeks before turkey season starts, I'll pretty much quit feeding, period. And I'll be on mineral all summer long. And, uh, you know, I it, a lot of it just kind of depends. You know, that farm, um, I would say, you know, I fed corn year-round on okay. that but not in all the areas of that farm, just where I knew that buck was. Um, there was, there was 
things that I wanted to change um, just because of knowledge that I've le- I'd learned and I changed on other farms that I didn't change on that farm because I felt, you know what, I do not want to make any changes. Whatever is working is working and I want to leave it alone. Like I never put a gravity feeder on that farm for that reason because I just I didn't want to change anything. I was still throwing corn on the ground. I did everything exactly the same because, you know, it was working. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Do you do you manage other farms as well or was this the one you were focusing on? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is obviously the one I had my focus on. I um, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's the it's the it's the it's the dilemma. You know, I'm, uh, you you know that this buck's there, and I can see you know what if if I were in that position, I would. How do you pick? I mean, you know which one you're going to focus on, but no, oh, I didn't abandon anything except for my checking account. <laughs> Except for the money in your bank account, uh, gotcha. I was working a lot of overtime. That's, I mean, like I said, six hundred fifty hours of overtime, and that that went towards hunting. Uh, <laughs> honey, you know, you know, I got a two year old and a, and a little four month old, so um, they take some money too. But uh, yes, I spent a lot of money in feed. I spent a lot of money in hunting. Um, I would say that um, no, I didn't abandon the other farms at all. Uh, me and Jeremy, we managed land together, and, and he's got his farm and. He's got a, um, another farm that, that he takes care of. And then basically I have, uh, I think, an 87-acre farm that I manage like consistently year-round. And then I had this farm that I did. And then um, around my house I have about 500 acres that I'm, um, I've got permission to hunt that I, you know, I feed it, uh, mineral it, run cameras on it. And so that's, what, 500,000, roughly 11, 1,200 acres that I have, and then um, I would say Jeremy's probably probably close to the same, I would say. So, yeah, I mean, between the two of us, we're feeding a lot of corn. Um, gotcha. And, so and I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I fed and mineraled them other farms exactly the same. I just didn't have as many cameras on them and probably didn't put as much time into them. Gotcha, and understandably so. I mean, that makes sense. Did, so other than your extreme scent control and your heavy – mineral soybean corn feeding and lots of cameras what other techniques and strategies do you would you say you go through on a routinely time frame like what especially when you go in actually to hunt what are there certain things that you carry in your bag and dusty i don't know if you want to try to pick yeah, dan's brain about what he actually carries with him yeah what? for sure let's get into that actually a little bit further what do you carry what what was you carrying the day you shot this buck wow um Let's see. I, obviously, my bow, um, three arrows, and uh, a particular brand. Can we talk about? Let's break it down in a little more detail. Can you go through that or not? Yeah, I can do that. I mean, obviously, I, I was shooting a, a Bowtech Admiral, um, and you know, I, I, it was. Yeah, I shot probably thirty arrows a day. That's one of the things I did. I, I knew that when I had this opportunity, if I did, that I there's no way I could be trying to think about any kind of techniques. It had to be. 100% muscle memory. Um, I knew there was going to be way too much other stuff on my mind. Um, you know, I run a, a Canon G30 camera. Um, so, you know, between, you know, I got a muddy arm and a Canon G30 camera, and, you know, that's in my backpack. Um, my bow, arrows, broadheads, all that stuff. What kind of arrows? Uh, I was shooting Easton Full Metal Jackets. What was you tipping it with broadhead-wise? Uh, swacker. Two-inch Swacker. Swacker. Uh, mechanical broadhead. Um 75 pound pole i mean it had plenty of kinetic energy <laughs> right on um, for sure eight and so then i see um as far as calls um i had that uh, bone collector flex stone grunt to you and and i actually did um believe it or not i've not been much of a uh, we'll get into that later but I've never been much of a um for rattling and grunting and that was a technique that that day i kind of decided to let's give it a try but so I was carrying all the camera equipment um, and, and basically my bow. I mean, this, you know, I... Got you a little deeper into your backpack. What what else do you carry in there? Do you, you, do you have rattling antlers and that kind of thing? Yep. Um, I was using Ozonix. I had an Ozone machine. You know, obviously my second angle cameras. I had a range finder in there. Um, I always carry an extra release. That's uh, give me um, binoculars, small set of binoculars. Um what kind of backpack do you carry? Is there a particular brand, a backpack that you would carry in the woods? Um, 
I don't, you know, obviously when, when I was going to look for a backpack, it was just well, a... As long as it wasn't pink, right? Uh, yeah, as long as it wasn't pink and uh, <laughs> carried my camera and equipment. To be honest with you, uh, I'm not real, uh, you know, like tree stands, stuff like that. I just, uh, I spent so much time and effort and money into the feeding and, and all that that I I didn't have the money to go out and buy everything I wanted. Um, right, no, that's you know, completely understandable. I, in, in my mind, it was, man, I could sure use some new gear i could sure use this or that and i wanted this or i wanted to wear that but i didn't always have the opportunity to get what i wanted just because in my mind it was more important for me to spend my money in trail cameras feed and um you know stuff that was going to um actually help the pursuit of this deer all right yeah i completely agree to that what uh when you go to the woods what kind of boots do you wear uh, rubber, only rubber. Gotcha. Just, just a, a slip-on rubber boots. Yeah, just regular uh, rubber slip-on boots, uninsulated. Um, like I said, you know, I wear rubber boots everywhere. I'm crazy about my scent control. So anytime I'm hunting, feeding, whatever, it's rubber boots. So it, it's nothing for me to wear out two pair of rubber boots in a season. You know, you can only spend so much money, at, at, you know, unless you're just completely loaded to the gill with cash flow unstoppably, and, and, you know. It, that's not what every hunter can do, and and you tried to focus on what was going to benefit you to kill this, you know, uh, this monster buck, and and it sounds like you played it out pretty good, and you uh, you you did the right things to make it happen. That's part one. Part two is coming up next week. You don't want to miss it. That's that's for sure. Yes, we kind of left you hanging there because we actually we haven't even talked about the hunt yet. The hunt's the best part. So you don't want to miss part two next week. It's unbelievable. It's not what you think. It's, uh, wow. That's all that, you know, this, I think it's going to be a great show to leave the guest hanging, Jay, and, and just say, wow, what to come, what's to come I, with the hunt. I learned a lot about Dan's strategies and certainly understand a lot more about how to hunt a giant whitetail after I see all the efforts and he went over all those details with us about what he does. But wait till you hear how it unfolds. It's unbelievable. And I don't know if anybody's heard the story, except, of course, if you read it in the magazine. But you're going to get to hear Dan Goffman go play-by-play, step-by-step, over the course of an hour show, telling us every little detail of the hunt and how the deer was recovered. It's Uh, it's uncanny. Next weekend, you know... I was sitting there for the show, Jay, and I can't wait for it to come out. I know. I I, I would listen to this m- m- numerous times. It's the best story. It's a great story. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? Yeah, sure enough. The Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. You know, before you before you plant a food plot, uh, definitely seek out some educational help on preparing and prepping and fertilization and, you know, spraying and, and actually sowing the seeds. But uh, with our future guest here coming up is... Uh, Doug Castrava from the Horny Buck Seed Company. And uh, I think that uh, that show is going to be one you don't want to miss. That's some very good advice. And you can actually scroll through our, our catalog and find the the first show we did with Doug. And, of course, the one coming up, you're not going to want to miss that one either. It's all about how to get your food plot started from scratch. If you've Whether you've done it before or have never done it, or you've done it before and it didn't work out, this show will most likely set you straight. Some very... We, we, we break it down in some very basic elements, so that's coming up with Doug. Now, I want to say thank you to you for listening on the show. I want to thank, say thank you to Jim Snow for sponsoring the show with the Eurohanger. I want to say thank you to Jim Morse over at Morse Sporting Goods for sponsoring the show. And, man, Dusty, thanks for joining us as well as a co-host. And thanks to Jim Keller. Um, well, actually, Jim's on vacation, so we, but we always thank Jim anyway. Now, Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here with me on the mic? Uh, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can also look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors. And if you're on Instagram, shoot me a follow at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? 
Very nice, man. Well, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Um, if you're interested in becoming a partner sponsor on this show, um, we, can, we always have opportunities available. Just shoot me an email, same jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and I'll shoot you out our 2016 media kit and let you know about all our pricing and all that stuff. There are some very inexpes- inexpensive um, opportunities there for even the smaller companies that may be out there trying to get something off the ground. Uh, you can always join us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash big buck registry, Twitter, twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. Instagram is instagram.com forward slash big buck registry. You can see the theme. You can always give us a call at six, uh, seven, two, four, six, one, three, two, eight, two, five. Leave us some feedback about the show. Let us know what you like or don't like about this show. And if you have a dear story to tell, or if you have some suggestion of somebody you'd like us to talk to, or interview, or some some topic you lo- you would like us to cover. That's a, a great place to to also uh, just leave a, a message seven two four six one three two eight two five. You can even text that number if you'd like to. Other than that, if you would like to submit a buck to the Facebook Wall of Fame and be recognized in front of about two hundred and thirty thousand something diehard deer hunting fans all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all the instructions will be right there for you just follow us on itunes and subscribe to the show and leave us a review if you would please well dusty this has been an amazing journey part one of the dan kaufman buck part two next week and i can't wait to come back and listen well i'm dusty phillips I'm Jay Scott, and this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait.